All right, hello and welcome here. We're welcome back to the Christian Basic Series. Pastor John here, and uh, today we're going to be looking at Jesus Christ, the Lord, the doctrine of Jesus. I'm just going to read something to you from the Bible, and uh, so here we go. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light, so others can see that they are doing what God wants. God bless the reading of this word. That was John three sixteen, John chapter 3, verses 16 20 to 21, and the NLT. Wow, amen. So um, you may have heard that, um, the, um, the first passage, right? Or this is how God loved the world. Um, but uh, really the meat and potatoes is in the following verses. So um, that's the essence of the passage, um, because Jesus already here, um, as he's speaking with uh, the Pharisee Nicodemus, he's explaining um, and pointing directly to himself. Uh, the essence, the reason um, uh, for, for believing in him, right? Because there's judgment. And so, yeah, these are, it's a very important to put, uh, not to take passages or verses out of context, but keep them together. And so um, this is the entire package. So read John 3, 16 to 21 yourself. Um, this was an NLT, it's a paraphrase, um, but it really captures, um, Jesus tells us here about the difference between belief and unbelief and uh, accepting Christ as personal Lord and Savior or rejecting him. So there's a, this is important. So there's a big difference here between life and death. Um, in other words, people through their free will, as Jesus reveals, choosing to go to heaven or to go to hell, unfortunately, right? So it's people's choice. And um, that's really the, the bottom line here. So uh, people choose uh, eternal salvation or eternal damnation. It's very important um, to make that decision for Christ. So... Um, there's no second chance, right? After when we die, there's no uh, second chance opportunity to make things right or do anything. There's no board of appeal. Um, that's it. So your decision matters. And this is very important and big one. We must very carefully um, not dismiss this, uh, what Jesus says. But uh, so we have a choice to make, hopefully. All of us as believers, um, there's a choice for Christ, hopefully, and not against Jesus Christ. So that's really the bottom line here. So, okay. So keeping that in mind, we're talking today about the doctrine called uh, the doctrine of Christ. We call it Christology. So basically Christology is the uh, about the nature and work of Jesus, um, his incarnation. Uh, the resurrection, right? A real physical resurrection and the um, relationship between um, uh, Christ. Christ has two natures, both human and divine. So that's pretty much the focus that we're going to look at. And so it's interesting that uh, in the Bible and in the Bible only, as God's word, Jesus is the word, remember? We had looked at that before. Um, can we uh, read and learn about the person of Jesus Christ? And I guess that would make sense. God gives us his word and we have his word. 
So um, that's pretty much it. So the Bible is here about the person and works of Jesus Christ and also our personal relationship with Jesus. So what are we going to focus on here? So we've got three parts, basically. One <coughs> is the question we, we want to answer, ask and answer is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? What did he do? And why did he come? So I repeat, um, who is Jesus? What did he do? And why did he come? So um, just as a little warm up, if you've been following along the series, um, we already dealt with the fall. Remember the fall of mankind? That was the, um, the our human ancestors, Adam and Eve, having been tempted by the devil, Satan, uh, fell into sin and um, estrangement from God, right? So God had cast them out of Eden, the Garden of Eden, real people, Adam and Eve, a real place, Eden, in judgment, um, along with um, us then as fallen mankind having to deal with Satan, sin, evil, and death. So, what does Jesus have to do with this? So, Jesus comes on the scene um, uh, following the fall. Um, but before he comes, as recorded in the gospel, as, uh, as before Jesus is born here, as, as God in the flesh, um, the Israelites had to make atonements, right? The sacrifices on a regular basis to God himself. All right? And so, there we have the, um, what is called the Mosaic Law, uh, which also has the Ten Commandments um, given to Moses by God. So um, these are covenants, right, that God uh, makes with people. Uh, covenants are like um, agreements, right, between God and people. And <laughs> unfortunately, as we learn from the Old Testament, nobody is able to fulfill the law, right, the Mosaic Law. Um, and why? Because of the sin nature we have inherited. So we need, there is a need for a perfect redeemer, savior and sacrifice. And um, so a perfect redeemer, savior and sacrifice is needed. And this is then done and accomplished in and through Jesus Christ, his life, death, uh, resurrection and ascension. So that is his fully completed work on the cross. Amen. That That's... That's pretty much it. That's very important to understand. All right. So who is Jesus? What does the Bible tell us about him? And what can we learn about his identity? So when we see Jesus the Messiah, that means uh, he's the savior of mankind. So um, as an example, I just mentioned the Old Testament. So in other words, before Jesus came on the scene, as recorded in the Gospels, um, uh, Jesus... Jesus fulfilled at least 300 Old Testament prophecies. I mean, that's at the very least. There's 300 Old Testament prophecies um, that Jesus fulfilled. And that is astonishing. Uh, this is something we just don't want to dismiss. And um, we can see that, uh, especially in his uh, ancestry, right? Jesus, the, his genealogy is um, recorded in uh, in the Gospels and in Matthew, for example, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. So this is really, really interesting. Um, that is one fulfillment in his genealogy. And uh, there are many, many others, uh, other prophecies um, fulfilled in Christ about his life, its birth, life, death, victory and reign, and also what other people do. Um, as Jesus comes on the scene. So it's, it's very, uh, it's something we just don't want to easily dismiss. But we're just going to focus you on one thing, and, um, focus, and that is God's promise. Do you remember the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel we talked about in Genesis? Um, so God, uh, Genesis 3.15, uh, fulfills uh, this promise from Genesis. So um, we're going to look at one prophecy, just that one, we could have looked at more, but we're going to look at one prophecy fulfilled in and through Jesus, and that is the virgin birth of Jesus. It is predicted by the prophet Isaiah in seven, chapter 7, verse 14, 
in which we can re re read about it then in Matthew 1, 23. So this is the most helpful way to understand um, Jesus' identity. All right, so we're just going to focus on one out of 300 and more prophecies. So the virgin birth, how, how is that even possible? Right? What, what does the virgin birth mean? Through the virgin birth, um, Jesus' mother Mary, uh, God accomplished um, the incarnation, that is, um, God himself coming to us as God in the flesh. And um, the reason for this is because Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So this is one of several uh, of Jesus' divine, unique uh, um, qualities, if you want to call it that, um, making him different than all human beings being born before or after him. So very important to understand. Nobody was incarnated by the Holy Spirit. Nobody ever will be again. And uh, nobody rules in that sense uh, like Jesus did in that, in the way that it is expressed in the Gospels. Why does this matter? Is a good question to ask. Why does this matter? So uh, the incarnation tells us about the sinlessness of the Son of God. So Jesus was born sinless. So that means unlike us, you and me and anybody, Jesus is born uh, without our fallen human sin nature. Um, why is that important? This is necessary because only being born sinless could Jesus complete his atoning work on the cross, that is dying in our place, um, as the only perfect sacrifice that is then acceptable to God. Um, God confirms this sacrifice, this perfect sacrifice, Right? The other ones, the other that uh, those covenants didn't work, but this one uh, works uh, once for once for all. And how does God confirm? He accepts the sacrifice through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. So, but wait a moment. Right. You can ask. So, how how is Jesus right both fully God and and yet uh, one person like fully man and yet God in the flesh. How does that work? So in Luke one thirty five we read, um, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. God bless you with his word. So in this verse here where the angel reveals to Mary what is going to happen, um, we learn more about the uh, person work of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus is conceived as sinless, sinless, holy, and divine. I repeat, Jesus conceived, sinless, holy, and divine. That's what the Bible tells us. So there is um, and this, this, this combination of being simultaneously both Full deity and full humanity in one person is sometimes called the hypostatic union. All right, or we'll try to leave as many theological terms as much, but if you can remember one thing the unity of Christ's full deity and full humanity is what is referred to as a hypostatic union. And this uh, unity um, shows us uh, uh, two, two things really. So for one, <coughs> other than uh, us, so all of us, um, other than Jesus, every person who was ever born before or after Jesus is limited, right? And we cannot make ourselves right with God in our own strength apart from God. It's just not going to work. It's not going to happen. The Bible tells us that. But two, which is more important or equally important, is we learn that God is not limited uh, remember, we were talking about the doctrine of God. They, God has certain attributes that we do not have. So it is only through God's grace and mercy um, that he provides and has provided salvation for mankind, for anyone who repents and believes in Jesus Christ. Remember the opening verse? There Jesus tells us that. And um, there you have it. So it's only through God's grace and mercy provided through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross 
um, that salvation for mankind is is possible. So, so we'll, so we'll just take a short little break here. Think about what we just heard and read. So, good. Next question, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Big one. So we're going to consider the work of Christ um, briefly. Remember, there's an article, uh, there's a link to an article you can read, and it has everything covered in much more detail and depth. So we're just taking a look at uh, some of the essentials um, of uh, Jesus' uh, person and work. All right, so... As God in the flesh, the God-man, um, we learn in the uh, recorded Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, that um, um, Jesus has, as, as just plain human being, the same characteristics and limitations like a human being, like, like, like you and me. So that's important because um, basically he had the same needs as we. He, you know, he's hungry, uh, hungry, angry, lonely, tired at times, and he needs food to eat. He needs to sleep, right? He needs uh, interaction with other people, just as we do. And so that is the the human side. So, but the divine part uh, about him is then comes across as we read the Gospels, right? The, uh, in Matthew, the, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's, a, it's, it's, stro it's a, really amazing once you take a closer look at it um, because the Gospels um, authenticate him, that is Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, as the promised Messiah. So just on a little side note, you may have heard of other so-called Gospels, um, but there are no other Gospels. Those other ones... Um, what call themselves gods, but they're false, right? These are man-made fabrications. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four genuine Gospels. Everything we need to know, all of Jesus' teachings and miracles um, are recorded there. And what is important is that uh, they always, the, uh, his, his teachings and miracles are true, and they always point directly to him. So... All right, sometimes people say or claim, yeah, Jesus Jesus was a great teacher, a good person, or a great prophet, and that is it. But, however, that's false. So let's take a little closer look at this uh, to address that, right? So, um, so for, there's four parts of what Jesus teaches. Um, they are, his teachings are coherent, cohesive, and they point to absolute truth, that is basically to himself. So firstly, Jesus teaches us about himself and his unique relation with God the Father. All right. So it's again, it was mentioned in the doctrine of God, but um, Jesus makes these claims to divinity. Remember the I am statements? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. That's in the Gospel of John, and there's many, many more. Um, and combine that verse with John 15, verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have um, absolute truth expressed here. What is absolute truth? Yeah. So, in other words, um, God is absolute truth, right? Jesus' truth uh, does not depend uh, on any set of um, circumstances or anything else um, but God himself, God's absolute truth. Why? Because Jesus Christ is truth himself. So that's one of the things where we learn, or you may have heard, um, you know, somebody may say, well, all religions lead to heaven, I think, and uh, maybe believing in Jesus is just one of many different ways. This is false. This, this is absolutely false. And uh, this is what we call... Um, Religious pluralism. Um, I'm not going to expand upon, upon that a little bit further because I want us to focus solely on the Gospels, what they say. But in the article, there's a, uh, there's a little bit more on um, the reason why religious pluralism is self-refuting. All right. So why that statement, all religions lead to heaven 
and believing in Jesus is just one of many ways. So um, we're going to deal with that. It's dealt with in the article. But let's look more at what the Bible tells us, uh, what else Jesus teaches. So he teaches us about God the Father. Remember the Holy Spirit, the, the triune God, uh, God the Father, God the Son, Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So uh, he teaches us, Jesus teaches about God the Father and his relationship with him. So that's also recorded in the Gospels. And uh, we also learn more about the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of heaven. Jesus call, uh, tells us, calls, tells us more about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven has arrived, right? John the Baptist basically says is the messenger. as another fulfilled prophecy. But um, it is basically, um, uh, um, John the Baptist says the kingdom of heaven is, is near, is, is close. And basically Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is here because he has arrived as um, God in the flesh, that is himself. And lastly, which is a very important one, is uh, Jesus teaches us about the Holy Spirit. And this is so important because in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and 16, uh, Jesus has just a few more hours, really moments, left uh, to live before he's uh, handed over, falsely accused, and uh, put on trial, crucified, and uh, um, murdered on the cross um, by people plotting against him. And so um, Jesus tells the disciples and tells us as we read John chapter 14 to 16 all about the Holy Spirit so um, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit that he will release him and he does they dread Pentecost after his ascension right and so um, we can trust him for for his word and so he does and that's a big difference um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament because the Holy Spirit was, um, in the Old Testament, uh, just um, not always, you know, uh, available to all people, but was working in and through specific people for a specific reason. Whereas now, the Holy Spirit is received, uh, released to all people. Any person who believes in Jesus receives the Holy Spirit. When they repent, people repent and believe, and they have the Holy Spirit working in and through their hearts and lives. So what does all this mean, these four parts, right? When we talk about absolute truth, um, it just shows us again that um, uh, Jesus points us to God himself as God in the flesh. And uh, as we, you know, would think he's relational. He's a relational, personal God. And this is important. Um, he cares, Jesus cares about and loves people whom he created, right? Everything was created through Jesus. As we remember the creation, the doctrine of the creation. So, sometimes uh, Jesus speaks in parables. And you may wonder, why does he do that? So what happens is, as Jesus moves um, closer and closer to the cross at Jerusalem, um, the enemy, the Satan, he's working in and through the hearts of people um, to harden them against Jesus, right? Which, which culminates... Then in the uh, plot of the Hebrew religious leaders to have Jesus apprehended and then uh, sentenced to death by the Roman government at the time uh, on the cross to have him killed. So the reason then is that he teaches in parables is that Jesus is still reaching out even to the people who are trying to, uh, to have him killed to reach whoever he can, uh, reaching people's hearts. And Jesus does the same for us today. So through parables, then, it is the only way that he's able to reach, well, whoever is available who's still reachable and teachable. So something you may notice when you read the, um, the Gospels, the Gospels are not, not always exactly chronologically arranged. Uh, they're arranged in a little bit different way. Oh, that's okay. Um, but um, the, uh, the importance is that um, Jesus does speak in parables, and they are, some of them are not so easy to understand. And um, Jesus explains to his disciples um, uh, why he's also uh, speaking in parables. Why? Because they ask him. 
So read that in the Gospels yourself, right? And uh, so check that out. So, all right. So what about Christ's miracles, right? The, uh, the miracles that um, Christ does are both unique, exemplary, uh, in both quantity and quality. Um, they are, they, there's healing miracles we learn about. Um, he shows his authority over the Gentiles, that is, the non-Israelite people at the time. He shows his uh, authority over all creation in nature. Right? Jesus calms the storm, the water, for example. He walks on the water, and there's many other examples. A lot of that is in the Gospel of Matthew. So um, read about that too. And uh, he also reveals, um, for example, if you read the Gospel of Mark, his authority uh, is demonstrated over the spiritual realm. That is fawn demons, for example. And we're going to briefly look at that very important one uh, in just a moment. And amazingly, um, Jesus also shows his um, the miracles point uh, to his ability um, to uh, uh, rule over life and death. It's really amazing. That's in Matthew. If you want to read it, Matthew nine, verse eighteen to twenty six, and John eleven. 1 to 44. It's all in the article. Don't have to memorize it now. But uh, there you have it. So Jesus' um, miracles are both unique in terms of uh, w w uh, what is done and just the sheer amount is uh, for what is recorded is astonishing. So so here's a big one. So this is a very big one. I want you to pay, pay careful attention, please, here. Because um, among the most important works, um, works and miracles, um, um, you know, they, we really can't separate them, uh, what Jesus does. But one of the most important works, and we need to understand this, is how Jesus demonstrates his authority over Satan, that is the devil. All right? So in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, it's also recorded in Matthew for, uh, sorry, Matthew 4, 1 to 11, and in Luke 4, 1 to 13, we learn about how the enemy tempts Jesus. Right? Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's tempted just as a mere human being. And what happens here is we see the power of God's word. So, as remember Adam and Eve and being tempted, and the Satan, the devil, is speaking to Eve and tempting her? He does the same thing here. Um, with Jesus after he's like 40 days in the 40 days in the um, wilderness in the desert and yes he he's hungry and lonely and tired and uh, the enemy confronts uh, Jesus there Satan does so just like he does in the Old Testament he distorts God's word as he challenges Jesus however uh, this confrontation when Jesus speaks back God's word correctly, as it is supposed to be used, um, in context and um, uh, as, it, as God desires and God intended, intends it to be used, he speaks back to the, to the devil, to Satan, and Christ wins this uh, battle on our behalf. So here, as we had just said, we see uh, God's authority working in and through Jesus in word and deed. And that battle is so, um, here we see that Jesus is reversing, right? The outcome, outworking is of the fall. Um, Satan, the enemy, the devil, uh, he tempts us, right? And we, uh, without Jesus Christ, we're, we're helpless. But Jesus um, defeated him in, in, in the wilderness there. And um, so we have a reversal here of, um, um, in other words, Jesus is undoing the work of the devil, so to say, right? So he obeys God. He doesn't fall into a temptation that, that leads to sin. And so, um, so that's one more reason we, we see the importance of uh, Jesus' life and work there. So, um, yeah. Just one more thing to consider as um, Jesus is um, doing all of these things, o uh, over and over he's humbling. God is humbling Jesus. 
right to the point of being like um, like a servant. And uh, Jesus says, right, I came to serve, not to be served. And so that's also our call too. And um, um, Jesus helps us. He's there to help us to overcome the enemy. And he has. He demonstrates uh, his full authority over Satan. And uh, you can read about that in John 14, 30 to 31. So he surrenders um, to God's final and eternal will, um, not without a struggle, right? As he's, he has a, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane a few hours, moments before he's handed over and uh, apprehended and then shortly after crucified and killed. Um, uh, he surrenders to God's will but not without a struggle, right? The mere human being, our Lord Jesus, asks, uh, you know, God to, to remove that cup of suffering from him. It's in Luke 22, 41 to 46. And you want to read that also in Mark 14, 32, 42. So there was a struggle, and um, Jesus does not give in um, to any, to disobeying God, and he follows through, even though he... Only Jesus knows what he's up against there. Um, so he's determined to follow through on God's plan in order to accomplish his work on the cross. So a very big one. Okay, so let us just take a short moment, uh, just a breather here, um, and uh, just briefly reflect what we just heard. ready all right so lastly was the last part of why did jesus why did jesus come why did jesus come so as we saw um jesus coming is closely linked to his work so we can't really separate the two um so this one is like you know to um, what we call the cross of christ to die on our behalf on the cross and secondly is the uh, resurrection and ascension of Christ. So um, we, we can ask, right, why did Christ die? And um, was this necessary, right? And the answer we, um, we have in the Bible is a revealed to us, and we have to look both um, backwards and forwards. Remember the Old Testament, backwards to the fall, and then forward to the uh, resurrection and ascension, and the um, second coming of Christ on Judgment Day. Right? We're going to look at that too uh, in more detail. So uh, Jesus reverses the outworkings of the fall, and that's why the Bible talks about uh, the first Adam, uh, first Adam, right? As Adam and Eve, as the first Adam, and Jesus' redeeming work. Then um, that's why we, the Bible calls him the second. Uh, Adam, that is Jesus Christ the Messiah, um, because he makes the uh, the necessary substitutionary atonement. So what happens on the cross is that uh, through this uh, final sacrifice, and again I would encourage you to read the article, um, there's more details there, is that um, God basically just very briefly takes his wrath and places it on Jesus, his only son, God's wrath against all sin and evil. And in other words, we as human beings by default are God's enemies because of our broken sin state and the fact that there's nothing good about us. Um, there's just really by default without Jesus, there's just evil in us. And so we are by, by default God's enemies. So Jesus takes God's wrath on himself and... Um, uh, then God places um, and God places him um, in a position after his, uh, his, his death and then his resurrection. Uh, that sacrifice Jesus does on the cross is basically God's new covenant with mankind, the final and eternal uh, covenant. And it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it, it can be a Jewish or a non-Jewish person, any, anybody who believes um, in Jesus Christ uh, can embrace and uh, enter this new covenant 
that God has established through Jesus. So Jesus removes that uh, sin debt and uh, we uh, we owe because God is perfect and holy and we are we, we are not perfect and holy. So um, through Jesus' um, uh, through Jesus' work on the cross, um, our calling remains. Right? Remember the initial passage we just read in John 3, uh, verses 16 to 21? Uh, big one. Um, if you want to read something really astonishing, in other words, like people coming to Christ and the importance, read what happens as Jesus is dying on the cross. Read about the remarkable events um, that point to himself. It's in Mark fifteen thirty three, and uh, Matthew uh, chapter twenty seven, fifty one to fifty two. Read it yourself. Right, open your Bible and take a look at those. Very astonishing, right? Pointing to him. So what is amazing then is that after three days, as Jesus foretells, right? I mean, how is that possible that somebody before he's before he's even crucified and dies, tells that he's going to be resurrected on the third day, right? That's like, hmm, how does that work, right? That's unusual. But Jesus foretells that, that he would rise um, from the dead on the third day. And so the, um, the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ is foundational to Christianity. So the incarnation and the resurrection belong together um, and the resurrection is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is um, is is different from all other. Uh, remember, we had said, well, many other ways lead don't uh, don't uh, don't many other ways also lead to heaven? No, because only with Jesus uh, do we have the resurrected Christ. So, what do what do we learn about? What do we mean? about the uh, resurrected Christ. So first of all, and there's some things again the Bible doesn't tell us, right? We don't know, we don't know why, but the Bible tells us enough about the resurrected Christ, what the res resurrected uh, resurrection means. So uh, first of all, his body is perfect, right? There's no longer, no aging, no weakness or death, right? At the time he still has the marks, at, it, at it, the crucified marks in in his body and um, whatever other inflictions had been done by people to him and it's still visible however his body is different so uh, and then his body sometimes is recognizable and sometimes it's not the Bible doesn't tell us why right so there's certain passages they're in the article and uh, God doesn't need to tell us why but um, he does tell us um, what is important, and that is that the uh, resurrection of Jesus' body is physical. That's a big one. So it's not some kind of a you know symbolic thing. Or the resurrection really happened as a real event, and um, the resurrection body is physical. So there's a physical body that Jesus has, and so um, Jesus himself, right, in Luke twenty four. 39 he shows he points to that um, the um, to the resurrection uh, make sure like that this is me right they give him something to eat and he eats and uh, yeah I read this for yourself that's very very important so why is the resurrection what does the resurrection mean for us so it's very important because it gives us hope right and it provides us a major reason that we can trust in Jesus, that we be, we can believe and have faith in Christ, right? So um, that's why the resurrection and believing in the resurrection is important. And at the same time, it's also a stern warning um, to people who do not believe in Christ. Since we can establish, the Bible does tell us, there's a resurrection for both believer and unbeliever. Look here at Acts chapter 24, verse 15, and John 5, 28 to 29. It's also in the article. So because rejection of Christ then means both um, spiritual and physical agony for all eternity in hell. And I repeat it, 
the rejection of Christ means both spiritual and physical agony for all eternity in hell. It's in Matthew 10, 28. And it's just something where I just, gosh, like we just pray that people turn to Christ, that they don't have to experience that. Um, so that does not need to be so, right? It, there's a choice we have to make. Remember, we can choose through a free will to choose um, to turn to Jesus with repentant hearts. So, um, good. So that was the resurrection there. Very important, uh, the most important part of Christian doctrine. And so, um, after the, um, the, um, the resurrection is then the ascension. Um, and before Jesus ascends in bodily form into heaven, which is also recorded in the Bible, um, he, um, he is uh, calling us to himself. He gives us the great commission that is to share the gospel. In other words, to invite people to open the Bible, right? Remember, all, the best Bible is an open Bible and to, and to share and embrace God's word and truth uh, every day anew. And, and that's part of what it means to share the gospel and to uh, share the great commission or fulfill the great commission with others. It's in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And at the same time, it's also a call to repentance. And repentance is just so important, very important. You can't remember anything. <laughs> it's a lot of material here. Uh, so um, is repentance means renouncing sin. That means forsaking it and walking in obedience to Jesus. Doesn't mean we'll never sin again. Probably not. But what we do is we, when we do a sin, uh, is we turn immediately to Jesus, confess, and um, and uh, he he has forgiven us our sins. But we have to turn to him to confess and re and uh, repent of our sins. And over time, you know, we get more sensitive to uh, sin and evil, and we just don't want to, you know, walk in in sin and evil anymore. So, um, which doesn't mean that, oh, because somebody says, oh, I'm safe. No, I can sin all I want. That doesn't mean that either, right? Because we, we still uh, are under God's grace. And so we want to, you know, out of our hearts, with a disposition to our hearts, so as Jesus to, um, to joyfully anticipate uh, the fact that Jesus is going to return. And that is his second coming, uh, also called parousia, the parousia. Um, that is the time. At the moment when he uh, consummates, completes his eternal kingdom. So Jesus is coming again. We don't know when, the Bible doesn't tell us. We're not supposed to figure that one out. But he is. And so that keeps us uh, living actively and for Jesus as believers and followers. All right. So that was a lot. Um, right. He's got a little homework here for you um, to consider. Um, why not read the entire Gospel of John? Read the entire Gospel of John. There's also the other Gospels, as I said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But um, why not start with John? Um, John is written in a way that anybody can really understand it um, and embrace it. And it's written for a more general uh, you know, audience in mind. But um, it's an awesome, it's an awesome Gospel and... Um, um, it, it's worthwhile dedicating your time. So that's read the Gospel of John um, without any distractions, right? No phones, no TV, and read through it in one go if you can, right? Spend a <coughs> morning and afternoon, maybe have a little lunch or coffee break, but read it through in one go, the Boston jo uh, Gospel of John. You're not rushing through it, but you come um, with an open heart and open mind and even if there's some things um, you know you may not understand at first, uh, it's yours for the asking. Go for it, read it. All right. So summary. Uh, just as a little summary. So here we have the overview of who Jesus is, why he came, uh, what he did in his life and work, died mm -hmm. on the cross to atone for our sins, and then which was then confirmed as. Uh, through God uh, himself, God the Father, then through the resurrection that uh, Jesus' atonement is final, uh, eternal, and complete. 
So Jesus is uh, unique and uh, absolutely unique, right? Absolute truth there. And um, we want to understand who he is and why he came. And without that, we can't have, you know, faith, saving faith, we may call it. But we're not saved if we do not believe in Jesus Christ as God in the flesh and his atoning work on the cross along with his resurrection. So that's very important to understand. So as, as always, there's a link in the video description for a detailed article. You can access all there freely. And all this material is for you to freely use and share. And um, yeah, so we're going to be looking at the uh, next uh, time. We're going to be looking at the doctrines of sin and salvation. So we'll talk a little bit more about the nature of sin and the nature of salvation. And uh, we keep in mind that Jesus is the only one who has uh, solved that sin problem for us. He's the only one who can help us. All right? So keep that in mind, and um, I will end with a short prayer. So Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this blessed day. Thank you that you've provided us with your word. Um, thank you for all your teachings and miracles you did. Thank you for dying for us on the cross, for all mankind, for our sins, and uh, having been risen, uh, having been raised on the third day and ascended to the highest heaven, we pray that people um, embrace these truths, read about you, learn more about you, and um, come to you freely as you call them and enter a personal relationship with you. So that's what we pray for. We thank you for revealing yourself to us as God in the flesh. And um, um, may whoever hears this or listens to this or watches this uh, be blessed and uh, encouraged to open the Bible and read and learn more about you, our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and love you and praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And always remember, the best Bible is an open Bible. Please join us again soon.